and welcome to Anime's Christmas Without Cruelty Fair. Um, it's pleasing that so many of you have come to this, our last talk of the day by Andre Nash. Um, by profession, Andre is a vet, and he's incredibly active in his work to stop animal suffering. In fact, the list seems almost endless. He is scientific advisor to the South African Association Against Painful Experiments on Animals. Founder Chairman of the Israel Association Against Painful Experiments on Animals, the USA Representative of the International League for the Protection of Horses, UK Representative for the Society of Animal Welfare in Israel, Animal Welfare Representative on the National Council on Animal Experimentation of the Ministry of Health in Israel, and Vice President of Pro Animal Agency in France. He has also been instrumental in phasing out dog tests in the training of battlefield paramedics in the Israeli Defence Forces, and in the last few months in obtaining a court ban on the force feeding of geese for Foigra in Israel after 10 years of hard work. Today we are lucky enough to have him here to talk to us about patient rights and animal roles. On Domenach, thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to first of all thank um, Catherine Neal and Anil A for making this uh, appearance possible today. The talk is um, going to be divided into two parts. The first will be a formal presentation, and the second will be some discussion of effective campaigning, and followed by questions and answers. <coughs> Now, as you all know, after laboratory testing, including animal experiments, new medications and medical devices are then applied to people. And there are four phases in clinical trials. Clinical trials, for those of you who don't know, is, a, is, is human experimentation, experimentation on people, but with a sugar coating. There are a lot of terms in medical research which, are, which have a sugar coating to make them sound better. And you'll see what I'm talking about in due course. So once a, an experimental drug has passed the preclinical stage, in other words, it's been tested on tissue cultures and animals, it then comes to the first human beings in phase one. And phase one is the use of healthy human volunteers. Now here again we come across a term volunteers which sounds very nice, but in actual fact there's no such thing as a volunteer. Because people who take part in these phase one trials are usually medical students in need of some extra cash, or else employees in the pharmaceutical industry whose arm can gently be twisted to take part in these experiments with or without um, financial compensation. Uh, the, other, the other disturbing thing about using healthy humans in clinical trials is that 70% of the medication that is used on these people passes phase one. You might, you might think that that sounds good. But what it means is that 30% didn't pass. That 30% damaged people and even killed people. Healthy people. Healthy people. Phase two is the use of patients, in other words, people who are ill, people who can actually benefit from this new experimental drug. What is interesting is that only 35% of the experimental drugs pass this phase. You remember 70% pass this, only 35% pass this. What does that tell us? That tells us that these tests here are largely useless. This is where some of the, most of the problems show up, here as well. But th this is where the real problems show up. So what phase one is telling us is that, is that nobody really trusts or believes the animal experiments. And that's why we need, in order to generate human data, human data for the regulatory authority, we have to test. We don't have to. We shouldn't. But the pharmaceutical industry tests on human beings in order to generate facts and figures 
to show what happens to this drug in, in the human body. If we come to phase three, this is this is more patients. In other words, it's a much bigger trial than phase two. Again, it's it's patients, it's people who are ill, but it's a much bigger trial involving many more people, and only 25% of the experimental drugs make it through this. So, so really you can see that this is where the crunch happens. This is where the adverse drug reactions really show up. Phase four is post-marketing. In other words, that's following up once the drug has been released onto the market, by which time it's too late, of course. I mean, any, any damage here is, is in retrospect. The damage has been done, and you make a note of it. Now, some people think that it's okay to volunteer for a clinical trial. I mean, how, how much more altruistic can you become than to say, you know what, I'm healthy, but I care so much about humankind that I'm going to donate my body to medical research, my living body to medical research. That sounds wonderful. Should society allow healthy individuals to take part in clinical trials? Now, I'm, I'm going to make it easier for you to make up your minds if we just move it to this situation here, this parallel. Would a pregnant mother who is sane allow her unborn baby to be put at risk by taking an experimental drug? I think most of us here would agree with the resounding no. Now, let's just move it one stage up. Instead of pregnant mother, we have parent. Instead of unborn baby, we have child. Would any sane parent allow their child to take part in a clinical trial, healthy child, to take part in a clinical trial using an experimental drug where that child can only be damaged and not benefit. I think, again, we have no problem and we agree that the answer is no. Well, is it so difficult to go then to here when we replace parent, we substitute parent with society and the child with the individual? The individual here is an adult, it's a consenting adult, somebody over 18, by law, a child cannot give informed consent, cannot consent to participate in a clinical trial. Only their parent can sign on their behalf. So let's look at the individual here who's above 18 years old. In other words, can give, can give informed consent. What is informed consent? Informed consent is agreeing to take part in a clinical trial, no 